Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 346, featuring the third installment of my interview with the author of Empire of Imagination, Mr. Mike Whitworth. In this part of the interview, we talk about Gary Gygax versus Dave Arneson and the controversy over advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And we also talk about uh, Gygax's love-hate relationship with J.R.R. Tolkien, as well as religion. A lot of deep stuff here that I know you guys will like, so without further ado, here is Mr. Mike Whitworth. Was he just a difficult guy to work with, or did you feel like they really cheated him out, or, or what? Um, I, think, I think they were both difficult to work with. I think both Dave and Gary are, are difficult characters to work with, and I think a lot of people had said as much, um, which is fine, because, again, these are these creative types, right? They're, these are these guys that create a company for the love of the game, not for the money, but all of a sudden it starts to get complicated because money starts coming in, and they're both kind of creative geniuses in their own ways. So they're oil and water, I think, really, when it comes down to it. I think the answer is that Arneson wasn't pulling his weight the gateway. Gary certainly wanted him to at TSR. Gary wanted him. He, he references when he first brings Arneson on that, that he's going to be cranking out material like a grist mill. You know, and, and Arneson's not cranking out anything. I mean, his, his name doesn't appear on the, the, the masthead of hardly anything over there in that period. Partly, again, according to some of the accounts I've heard, partly because the work isn't very good of what he's doing. And then partly because I think Arneson is not interested in cranking out material on, on a nonstop basis. I think he wants to game and have a life and whatever. Whatever the reason, um, what does happen is that Arneson's making a lot of money in, on D&D at this point, relatively speaking, and he's because he's royaltyed so well. Well, that's, again, TSR had set up these really generous royalty agreements on the front end because they had to in some cases because they couldn't pay people as staff members. They didn't have a lot of cash flow. So they would give people a lot of, they'd give them weird ownership. They would give them generous royalty, a lot of things like that. So Arneson starts to make a lot of money on D&D. And TSR, at this point, come, starting in around 76, has to start renegotiating or wants to renegotiate some of these contracts. So one of the accounts I heard is that they wanted to negotiate uh, a, um, a lower royalty with Arneson um, and that he refused and they, they thought about it and there was a lot of things like that and that they demoted him um, to some low position or something like that, at which point Arneson left. There's other accounts I heard where he was fired outright for not being good enough at what he was doing, writing games, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whatever the case is, there was definitely bad blood. There was definitely bad blood there. And I imagine it's a very gray issue. There was probably right on both sides or whatever. Um, but so here's why it becomes very, very important. Is that um, in 1970, well, it starts in, in the end of 77 is where TSR starts to put out advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is not Dungeons and Dragons. It, it, has, it has a lot more complexity um, in terms of its game mechanics. It, it, has a lot, it has a lot more of everything. It has more character types. I was like Gary said it was, it was like comparing chess and checkers, I think, is the way he describes that. <laughs> would, you, would you think that's valid? Well, no. Well, no. I mean, I, I don't. I, I keep in mind when Gary's saying stuff like that, he's already in some type of legal dispute with Arneson. Exactly. So, so here's, here's what happens in essence is that Arneson is making a, a, a pretty generous royalty on all D&D that's sold. All, anything called Dungeons and Dragons, making a lot of money on. As is Gary and, and the company. Um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, they're saying is a new game. So Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game. It's a very different type of role-playing game. And so you'll see these comparisons where Gary will call it you know, chess and checkers or whatever. Well, you know, he knows, you know, Gary himself, you know, probably realized he was having to be kind of proactively defensive about this because what they're doing is they're not paying Arnis and royalties on Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. That's important. Um, it just seems and, like a slimy move to me somehow. I, I don't know. You know, I, you know I, here's what I came out with it is that, and remember, my book's about Gary and, and a lot of the accounts I, I, I got were, you know, had to do with a lot with Gary and how Gary felt a lot about this stuff. We should write one on Dave Arneson next. That'll be fun. Yeah, right. Exactly. The next book, right? <laughs> be completely um, different. It, here, here's what I would say about it is that um, 
you know, I was talking about the history a little bit earlier, and I confused you probably even more with the way I described the whole thing. But Arneson built some really interesting kind of role-playing fundamentals as a result of three or four things that he had taken from other people, like Dave Wesley, who came up with this Brownstein, uh, diplomacy, miniatures, chain mail. You know, that was one of the fundamental pieces of Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign, which is kind of the first thing that resembles a role-playing game that anyone would, would recognize as a role-playing game. So, so Arneson is already using about a bunch of platform technology, you might say, from a bunch of other people. He comes up with Blackmore, uh, which is really, again, the first thing that resembles a role-playing game. He brings it to Gary. He, Gary basically takes it and writes Dungeons & Dragons. I mean, that's the official history, and, and Arneson has corroborated that mostly, that Gary takes Dave's notes and his, his, his concepts, and he writes the game. So really, Gary does the, the heavy lifting here. And it's a lot of heavy lifting. I mean, it's a, it, if you look at the original Dungeons & Dragons gaming books, they are really, um, they're, they're a little bit over the top, frankly. There's a lot of stuff in there that, that never, and no one ever ended up using in the game. Like, there's this concept of using a caller in the game where you have one person that declares the action for your group. If you look at, at how even Gary kind of, um, he, he, he tries to codify as much as he can to make a narrative-based game that could have an infinite number of possibilities. But a ton of thought went into this. I mean, Gary killed himself on this game. So, again, I, I'm, I'm giving you the, the context approach here. But here's what I would say is that I think by 77, I think Gary is looking at this fallout he had with Arneson. And I think he's sitting there saying to himself, gosh, I did all the work here. And Arneson's making all this money, continues to make all this money in the game, even though he's no longer employed here. When he was employed here, things didn't work out. So I, I think in a weird sort of way, I think he, he felt like doing Advanced Dungeon Dragons, he would... He would modify the game enough that that he could he could say honestly that well all of this stuff is new and even though it's based on this original concept that Arneson had that's all it was um, I wrote all I wrote every word of this book and, and of every word of the original uh, this is my game this is TSR's game this is not Dave Arneson's game and honestly I think he would have it would have all worked out for him just fine had he not called it Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Yeah, but of course, and you know, as you point out, though, if he called it something else, he might have lost. Who everybody would have just ignored it, right? Because they were looking for Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Exactly, Dungeons and Dragons is already successful by this time, so they'd be crazy to not ride the wave of that. But again, this is what I think gets them into the trouble. It is when when they they're not paying royalties to Arneson and Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. That becomes the core flagship game of TSR. All of a sudden, Arneson's royalty checks start drying up. And he's saying, what's, what's going on here? He sees that AD&D is the big game, Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons. And, um, and so, yeah, he takes him to court. He files a lawsuit in uh, early 1979, I think is when it's officially filed. And, and again, even leading up to that, you can see that there's been threats because you start seeing articles pop up in Dragon Magazine, maybe starting in as early as 78, but certainly in 79 you see it, where Gary's talking about these games have nothing to do with each other, and he talks talking about... <laughs> You know, and and again, so he's being proactive. He's kind of defending his case, but uh, I think he would he would have just as much told you that that there was there's there's a rhetoric element in that whole thing about how he's describing it. I mean, of course, it's a role playing game, and it's a role playing game called Dungeon Dragons. It's a fantasy role playing game. It has a lot of the same character uh, classes and archetypes, and so that's what gets complicated about it. And Arneson ends up winning. Um, uh, he ends up getting pretty handsome settlements in these lawsuits. Um, and does very well on, on the game overall. But yeah, TSR doesn't get away with that. Um, so I would say it, it's still a very gray element, though, is that while they're trying to butt out Arneson, it's more complex than that because Gary had done so much of the work, I think he kind of felt entitled to, to, to do it that way and, and, you know, didn't think it was a problem. Well, this is the part of the book, Mike, that just really blew me away, or blew my mind, I guess I should say, uh, was that, this this sort of hate I don't know hatred loathing I don't know what what words appropriate but uh, this this idea that Gygax really didn't like uh, didn't like being uh, accused of ripping off Tolkien or borrowing too much from Tolkien matter of fact didn't even like Tolkien <laughs> I think most of us would assume surely this guy that created Dungeons and Dragons must have been a huge Tolkien nerd you know right. uh, come to find out that's far from the case. Yeah, Matt, you've got it exactly right. He he said he said there's a lot of quotes, there's a lot of sound bites of, of Gygax, or I should say quotes of Gygax, talking about hated Tolkien, or I should say 
specifically Lord of the Rings. I, I, I guess you should clarify that. He actually kind of liked The Hobbit. Yeah, the Hobbit is a fairly manageable scale. It doesn't agonize over some of the stuff that, say, Lord of the Rings does. Um, but he didn't like Lord of the Rings in particular and didn't like Tolkien for the most part because there was no action in it. It was, it's kind of this high level stuff, the solutions, um, you know, they're kind of on a mountain and then a couple of birds pick them up and, and get them out of it. Like he, uh, Gary grew up in the tradition of pulp fiction and he loved Robert E. Howard. He loved Conan the Barbarian. That was his thing. Um, and he loved a lot of other stuff too. He loved, um, he loved Elric. He loved, uh, Fofford the Grey Mouser. I mean, he grew up in this, um, all of this stuff that, that he's really into um, is really savage swords and sorcery type um, fantasy, not not high fantasy like Tolkien. Yeah, this was the pulp fiction that you're talking about, right? So I guess this is kind of a foreign concept for most of us today. But, you know, I guess when Gary was a kid, you could go to the store and buy these little collections of short stories or serial stories, and they would be Conan or some kind of variation thereof, right? Buck Rogers, for that matter. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, so when Gary's growing up, he's still living at the tail end of the pulp era. So he's able to actually get, he's got a huge collection of, of real pulps as a kid. These kind of flimsy magazines made of this pulp weird paper. Weird tales, that sort of thing. Right? Weird tales, exactly, which is Chicago-based. So there's actually a lot of weird tales floating around where he lived, even though weird tales really had its zenith in the 30s. Um, you know, he's growing up mostly in the 40s and 50s, you know. So uh, he's born in 38. So, um, you know, so he's got real pulps, but then to your point, they start compiling a lot of these things starting around 1950 when there's some of this, this, uh, this interest in pulps from the twenties and thirties that were particularly good. Robert E. Howard being the best example. Robert E. Howard's work is mostly in the early thirties. Edgar Rice Burroughs a few times too. Edgar Rice Burroughs from the twenties, uh, you know, the John Carter stuff. Right. So Gary is very familiar with this stuff. And a lot of it is, um, pulps in particular, the pulp fantasy stuff is really, very, it's very, very savage. Different from, very different from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Very. Oh, it's savage. It's very brutal. Um, you know, so this is the stuff that's in, in Gary's head. You know, so Lord of the Rings to him is just boring. It's got unnecessary detail and it's kind of, you know, and, and again, I, 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 in a weird sort of way, I agree with him. Like, I think, you know, uh, Tolkien is a great world builder, but action is not his his strength, I don't think, as a writer. Not, not that I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm not criticizing Tolkien's writing. I'm just saying... <laughs> I, I don't think that's his biggest strength is the action part. Whereas Howard, that's that's really where what he's all about. And if you think about Dungeons and Dragons, the way it's created, you know, he said this many times that he used the Tolkien archetypes and the, the Tolkien ideas because he knew that's where the fantasy culture was. He knew that was the most popular stuff. Uh, and that's what would get people interested in playing the game. But that's not what inspired him to write it. What inspired him to write it was the fantasy stuff of, of Robert E. Howard, where and if you think about it, D&D is a game fundamentally built where you go into a dungeon, kill everything you see, and get treasure. It's very mercenary. It's very swords and sorcery. It's very bloodthirsty in a weird sort of way. Um, and that's what is in, was in Gary's mind when he creates the game. It's, it's, it's Conan. It's not, uh, you know, it's not Aragorn, you know, this, this very, um, you know, I mean, I guess the, think of it this way. Aragorn is not going to go into a crypt and kill everything inside and get the treasure. That's not... <laughs> something Aragorn yeah, is that there's not doing. a lot of role-playing games that you play as a hobbit right <laughs> exactly or a halfling if, I guess if people you're play close. those roles for fun or whatever but you know it's definitely I'd say the stereotype is clearly more of a Conan like character than a, a Frodo oh, totally. or Bilbo and, and that's how the game is really conceptualized I think it really turns into more of a of a high fantasy game again because the people that play it because they have so much control over what happens infinite possibilities they're building their own campaigns well if you grew up reading Lord of the Rings, you're going to build a campaign that's similar to that. So, the Battle of the Five Armies. Or I guess I yeah, right. <laughs> it's, I think the natural progression yeah. is really towards high fantasy, and that's how the game became so immersive and, and character-focused. But uh, at its core, the game was, is this very swords and sorcery type game. Um, and, but I think the other interesting part about it, though, is that if you read a lot of Gary's writing... Um, one thing I would say about it is that, so Gary was tremendously verbose. Uh, you know, he grew up with this antiquated giant dictionary of, of words that people don't use anymore. You know, and he was, he was explaining to a whole generation of people what these ancient weapons were like. This is, you know, Gary was really interested in history. He was extremely verbose, uh, even though he didn't finish high school, which is an amazing fact about Gary is that he, he dropped out as a junior in high school. Um, and his writing in a weird sort of way, I think, and, and ironically, 
is, is actually a lot like Tolkien. When you read Gary's novels and a lot of the stuff that he wrote, it's very wordy. It's very, I, I would say action wasn't Gary's strong suit either. So I think the irony of the whole thing is that the way he actually wrote was kind of like Tolkien, even though he far preferred the pulp style um, action and, and pulp style uh, narrative. I think I read a couple times that he got the spell system, that slot system came out of what, Jack Vance, some novels like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Vance is is um, yeah. I mean, Jack Vance was was one of the the big. Um, that's where a lot of the spell ideas, a lot of the magic systems um, that influenced a lot of role playing games. Uh, Jack, they come from the Jack Vance stuff. All right. So just a, a few last things here, but one thing I wanted to do before we 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 adjourn here, adjourn. What is this? Yeah. Court? What is this court? <laughs> well, one of the things I wanted to come back to a little bit is just more about. Gary himself and the kind of guy that he was, and uh, you'd mentioned a few times that he was actually quite religious, or uh, he seemed to have, I guess, a relationship with a religion. Let's put it that way. Uh, he had that quotation there, uh, but he's from a. He was a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses. He he was he um, Gary. So you mentioned quite religious, and actually, it's at certain times in his life that's that's true. Um, Gary was up and down with religion I, through most of his life. He, he grew up in a mostly secular type situation. Um, I mean, kind of regular church going, but but most, I mean, kind of secular focused. His first wife, Mary Jo uh, Gygax, is the one that got him into the Jehovah's Witnesses. She was a lot more devout than him. So starting around the early 60s is when Gary gets hooked up with an early yeah, I'm going to say early 60s, he's already hooked up with them. And so Gary is is a believer, for sure. I mean, he's a practicing Jehovah's Witness, but um, he wasn't, you know, I mean, like, I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, he was really, like, you can find his writings from that period, or some of his writings anyway, and he clearly is, is really buying into the Jehovah's Witness um, uh, doctrine. He's talking about, he's kind of anti uh, certain holidays and the way they celebrate certain Things that, that are unique to the Jehovah's Witnesses are things that, that Gary is writing about, he's telling his friends about, he's writing it down. Um, you know, but I will say this, too, is that while he was kind of devout at times, he also didn't do, um, well, Ernie mentioned to me, for example, that like football Sundays, it was very important that he would catch his football games on Sundays. He loved watching football, for example. So he also always had kind of a secular side to him. Whereas his wife was was out there with the kids all the time doing door to door stuff that Jehovah's Witnesses do, you know Gary wasn't doing that much of that, you know. So um, he was definitely committed and he was a believer for sure, and that's important because people. It's important to note in the scheme of a Jehovah's Witness because that's not a religious you, religion you practice very lightly. You can say so. <laughs> you're almost. Yeah, you had mentioned the door to door. You know, I mean, that was just every time I hear the word, or hear the phrase Jehovah's Witness, I'm, you know, imagine the knocking on the door and the, what is it, the watchtower? Is that, is that them with the, the watchtower? Yeah, the watchtower. That's the exactly watchtower. Right. It's sort of a very, uh, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> I'm no, you know, watching I, this, but I think it's safe to say it's not really one of the uh, more mainstream. That's correct. Uh, yeah. I, it's, it's definitely a, like a little bit of a different thing. And it's, um, so in Gary's case, with the birthdays, they don't celebrate birthdays, for example, and things like that. Yeah, like they have a lot of no voting, a lot of stuff with holidays and all of that. You know, so they have a lot of really interesting rules that are very particular to their to their doctrine. And what's important about it is that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that a lot of people, um, and I may have even said this myself. You know, he, he was devout. It's, it's it's not so much that he was a devout Jehovah's Witness. Is that by being a Jehovah's Witness, he was kind of fundamentally more devout than your average religious kind of passive religious person, right? You, you don't, it's not a very passive sect. No, I mean, these are folks that take uh, their religion quite seriously, right? Exactly right. So, but Gary was always a bit of a paradox here, though, because he was also a very worldly guy in a lot of respects, all through that whole period. So what happens with Gary is that he is practicing, his wife is pretty devout, his family becomes involved. And um, around the mid-70s is where he starts having a lot of falling out with the local congregation. A lot of it has to do with, it actually starts in the, in the early 70s. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they don't approve of his lifestyle. I mean, Gary drinks, he smokes, he's smoked his, smoked his whole life. Uh, that's stuff that's not okay in the Jehovah's Witness uh, you know, doctrine. And he's, 
he's doing these war, he's doing all this war gaming and he's making this game Dungeons and Dragons, you know, and this is stuff that they're not okay with. So he has a big falling out. They basically dissociate with the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, by the mid seventies. They're no longer connected, uh, and with this along with his wife, you know. And it's funny because um, I would say for quite a period in there after that, he's he's not particularly affiliated with any religion, not particularly connected to um, the Bible or anything else. Uh, for a long time after that, you know, the, the stuff that I found um, where he really starts to connect again, uh, again, according to my research, is really pretty late in his life, where Gary, um, in the early 2000s, Gary starts having a lot of health problems. Uh, he has a couple strokes. He has all these issues. And that's when Gary gets really serious about religion again. But it's it's in a more of a kind of an evangelical capacity. He becomes a uh, what you might call a, a gospel Christian. He starts reading the Bible every day on his porch. I, I know uh, his, his daughter, Elise, talked a lot about the fact that he read the Bible every day. And he was really into it. He was really interested in it. He talked about it. He started signing his emails uh, with Scripture. Uh, he would use uh, Matthew 5.16, I believe is what he would use, um, for, which was his favorite, favorite Bible, Bible passage. So he was very committed to it. He, was, he would get um, on these um, message boards. Fans for Christ was one that he liked a lot. And uh, he was very committed to it. So late in his life, very late in his life, I'm going to say the last four to six years, he was really um, uh, very involved in, in various Christian communities, although he was never a churchgoer, per se. He was never really into going to church, a physical building, that is to say. Um, he preferred the, play, yes. the Playboy Mansion, I think, or the <laughs> Playboy Club. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, again, so that's the period in there, that's a good example. The period in there, say, from the mid-70s through, well, for many, many years thereafter, is a period where I would say he's not particularly connected uh, from a religious standpoint. Um, so, so Gary, again, he's he's a very interesting character, even on the religious side, because he's got a lot of ups and downs, a lot of different things he was into, and I think he ended at a very interesting place, too, um, with this kind of very gospel Christian uh, mentality. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back uh, next week with the uh, fourth and final installment of this interview with Mr. Mike Whitworth. And by the way, if you guys have been enjoying this, you definitely want to check out the Google Air Hangout we just did. Uh, that's also on the uh, Matt Chat channel. Uh, that has uh, Mike Whitworth as a guest, as well as his brother, Sam Whitworth, who's a pretty famous guy in his own right. Uh, that uh, they, they come onto the show about uh, half an hour into it. Uh, but anyway, I'll post a link to it in the show notes so you guys can catch that as well. And as always, I want to thank you, thank you very much for your support of this show. You're keeping these episodes coming, guys. Little donations, a buck a show, all I ask, and it really uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, I wanted to uh, say a special shout out to my newest patron, uh, Mr. Michael Vondel. So thank you very much, Michael. Your uh, support is greatly appreciated, and I greatly uh, appreciate all the support from you guys who are... Uh, patrons or supporting me via PayPal or good old games or just telling people about the show. Uh, whatever you do to support this show, I personally greatly appreciate it and thank you. All right, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Let's see what's there in these ancient scrolls of wisdom for today. We have uh, a couple items here. Uh, one is uh, this book called the Atari ST and the Creative People, Volume 1. And uh, foolishly, I did not write down how long uh, this has left. But I don't think it's got very long, maybe a few days. So go check it out immediately when you watch this. Uh, it's eight years of the Atari ST demo scene. And the cool thing about it is uh, the way they've set this book up or laid it out is it's about the same uh, contours, I guess, as a screen. So a book in the format of a screen. And the reason they did it that way is to show tricks like border removals as if you were looking at a monitor on paper. Uh, anyway, I think it'd be more effective if you just go look at the, the pictures on their Kickstarter, uh, Kickstarter site and their pitch video. I think you'll agree with me it's definitely worth supporting. And 40, 40 euros, I don't know what that amounts uh, to in American dollars, but... Uh, anyway, I think it's uh, money well spent to get a hardcover copy of this thing. 
All right, another item from Kickstarter, Epic Tavern. I've mentioned this a few times. They got 43 hours left. Uh, they got forty thousand goals, uh, forty thousand dollars as their goal, which they've already met. But I, I forgot to mention last time their uh, stretch goals. <laughs> so uh, that's amazing because at fifty k, which are, they've already hit two of these. Uh, the first one was to get Becky Berger on uh, the team to write quests for the game. How cool is that? And then they're going to get a uh, Ian or Ian Livingston at sixty k, which they've already passed, and he's he's the uh, uh, finding <laughs> fighting fantasy game books guy, co-founder of Games Workshop. And uh, they're a little bit shy of their 80k goal, which means they're going to add elves. So that's pretty cool. And then uh, lastly, I want to talk about this game. Uh, somebody sent me Dark Fear, a pixel horror game with RPG and adventure game elements. Best described as a blend between RPG and adventure with 2D graphical style. Think Mist meets King's Quest. Its a simplistic approach allows even the casual gamers to unfold uh, its many layers of game mechanics. And one of the comments, I was looking at some of the reviews of it, and I really like this one from Ragged Robin. I wish more games were made like this. Humble, craftsman-like, functional, and fun. So for me, uh, humble, craftsman-like, functional, and fun is just the epitome of a great indie game. And I took a look at this. I haven't played it yet, but it looks great, and I wanted to pass it on share it with you. All right. Whew. I think that'll do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got a sort of a appropriately themed ale. This is the Lambden Dragon, Return of the Lambden Dragon Session Ale. This is drafted by Insight Brewing. We craft legends. These guys are out of Durham, England, Worms Wellspring. Let's see, they got a little quote here. There before me, the great beast stirred groggily and uncoiled from his long slumber in the springs below the tavern. Had it been their secret all along? Could dragon taste like toffee and hops? Pressing questions, but meanwhile, the monster opened its menacing maw. <laughs> Holy cow. Man, this is like the perfect ale for a, a Dungeons & Dragons session. A Lambton Dragon. Uh, let's see. Uh, alcohol 4.1. So definitely on the weaker side, which again is probably makes it very appropriate uh, for a Dungeons & Dragons session. You don't want guys getting too hammered. You know, they have to be able to focus a little bit, right? Uh, let's see. For more Draconic Daring Do, visit InsightBrewing.com. Anyway, this sounds great, so let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this return of the Lambton Dragon Session Ale here in the rather excellent drinking horn. You can definitely smell some hops here. It's not a really strong, powerful aroma on it. A little bit of a citrusy... Uh, yeah, I'd say a little bit of hops, a little bit of citrus, but kind of uh, on the mild side as far as uh, aroma goes. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. Hmm. Uh, so what do we got there? A bit of a uh, sort of cereal taste there, a little bit of a malty sort of flavor, I would say. Uh, a little bit of bitterness, just a little bit. Kind of uh, definitely on the lighter side. Which is not surprising. It's only at 4.1% alcohol. It's almost like a Michelob Ultra. <laughs> you know, if you've had that one, try it again here. There's a little bit of flavor here, but not a lot. And like I say, it kind of reminds me of a Michelob Ultra with a little bit of an extra hoppiness to it. It's uh, not really very much flavor here. I guess this might be fine if you just want something to uh, drink as you're playing Dungeons & Dragons and you, uh, you don't want to get intoxicated and you don't want something to just kind of uh, blow you away with the flavor. I think this would be a good choice. Let me try it again here. Yeah, you know, it's not bad. It's definitely a very light ale. Uh, this would be a good one, I guess, if you're... If you're <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you'd be playing D&D outside. Maybe if you're LARPing or something out in the hot sun, you don't want to uh, pass out from uh, strong alcohol. This would be a great choice. Now, otherwise, I'm a little disappointed. You know, I think with a name like Dragon, you'd have a lot of flavor and a lot of uh, uh, taste, strong finish on it at least. But uh, this one's definitely on the light side uh, in terms of flavor as well as alcohol. Uh, so I'm going to go, uh, I'll, I'll give it two out of five. You know, it's definitely, you can do a lot worse than this one, but I think there's... Uh, a lot better beers out there. Uh, so two out of five for the Lambton Dragon.
All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I got another one from my uh, Gunny's Rules book. Uh, this is a quotation by John Foster Dulles, which I thought this was uh, an excellent quotation. It goes something like this. The measure of success is not whether you have a tough problem to deal with, but whether it is the same problem you had last year. <laughs> Think about that one for a while. And see you guys next week. Who's the girl? A nuisance. Get rid of her. Why? They're trying to placate you with a sacrifice. Uh, whoever gave them that bright idea? Never mind. Just get rid of her. Oh. Eat her. Oh, please. Yeah. Aren't we squeamish? You ate Sir Eglamore. I merely chewed in self-defense. But I never swallowed. Improvise. <laughs>